Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Don Siegel. Uh, I'm an associate professor in mechanical engineering, and today I have the pleasure of introducing our last speaker for the day, Professor Gary Waz. Uh, professor Waz is the Walter J. Weber, Jr. Professor of Sustainable Energy, Environmental, and Earth Systems Engineering, and he holds appointments in nuclear engineering and radiological sciences and material science and engineering here at U of M. Uh, he's also held a number of administrative positions, including the director of uh, the Michigan Energy Institute. He's been the associate dean in the College of Engineering and also chair of the Nuclear Engineering Department. Uh, his research, as we'll hear about soon, is focused on materials for advanced nuclear energy uh, systems and radiation material science, including environmental effects on materials, uh, radiation uh, effects, ion beam surface modification of materials, and nuclear fuels. One of the things he's most uh, noted for is his development of proton irradiation as a technique for emulating neutron irradiation effects in light water reactor structural materials. Um, he is a fellow of many societies with uh, three-letter acronyms, including the TMS, the MRS, the ASM, and the American Nuclear Society. He's also the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Nuclear Materials. Um, He's published over 250 papers, 220 invited talks, um, and has won numerous awards. Uh, maybe the most notable is the Presidential Young Investigator Award from the National Science Foundation. So I think I'll stop there, turn it over to Professor Wass. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, so thank you for the very nice introduction. <clears throat> And thank you especially for all of those who are gutting it out to the very last talk. <laughs> of course, now that I thank you, you can't leave. <laughs> but <clears throat> given the late hour, I promise I will not go over. So you'll be out of here by a quarter or two. So Don, you start waving at me when it's within five minutes and start throwing things at uh, 45 minutes. <clears throat> uh, as Don said, I, I, I've been spending a lot of my time looking at uh, materials behavior in nuclear systems. And um, I'm going to address that today, but I want to back up a little bit and sort of cast the net a little bit more widely by, by addressing this whole issue of materials and high temperature energy applications. And um, <clears throat> it may be interesting to note that if you look at the energy generation in the US, electrical energy generation, last year, and you look at how it's distributed according to source, you'll notice that gas, coal, nuclear amount to about 84% of our electricity. Okay, with hydro, wind, and biomass, and solar uh, filling out the rest. So that's a lot. That's a large percentage of our electricity coming from sources that um, uh, uh, result from very high temperature systems. Uh, and it hasn't changed too much. If you look at a decade ago, back in 2006, it was about 86% of electricity from these same sources. So the, the message here is that high temperature materials for electrical energy generation are going to be around and needed for a long time. Uh, we're not going to see this go down to zero in the next 10 years. There's a, there's a change as we move into renewables that don't require that kind of, these kinds of environments, but it's not going to be a fast one. And by the way, the biggest difference in the last 10 years is that gas has doubled in uh, uh, capacity factor and coal has gone down by about 40%. <clears throat> so the key is that all these, all these uh, systems uh, use high temperatures. Uh, to generate very high efficiencies. And so uh, we're looking at um, uh, fossil plants in terms of gas, coal, nuclear plants. I'm not going to be talking about wind, solar, or hydro uh, materials for those systems because they don't see the same kinds of things. And that means the metals I'm talking about are going to be primarily metals and alloys and some structural ceramics like silicon carbide, even graphite. Not a ceramic, but, it's, but nevertheless, it's not a metal. But not polymers, no biomaterials, no organics, and no silicon in this last talk today, OK? You hear more metals tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> if you look at, for example, uh, coal, uh, uh, coal plants that produce electricity, uh, the 
current state of these plants is to drive to supercritical coal plants. That means they're using water in the supercritical state. And that's because you really boost the efficiency. And you can see the number of plants here uh, for the, uh, uh, worldwide. Uh, and the, that puts real big demands on the types of materials. So this is just a temperature pressure diagram for water. It's just a phase diagram for water. And you go from the subcritical regime to supercritical to ultra supercritical to advanced supercritical. We're just pushing up the temperature and pressure scale. And that um, puts more demands on materials. So you can see that um, in the subcritical regime, temperatures of about 540 degrees C and pressures around 20 MPA produce efficiencies below 40%. But as we push to supercritical, ultra supercritical, advanced ultra supercritical, temperatures are very high, as are the pressures, in order to get those efficiencies as high as possible. So it makes sense. But that means the onus is on the materials, as usual. In the subcritical and supercritical conditions, you can get away with ferritics. But as you start moving up the temperature scale into ultra supercritical and advanced ultra supercritical, you notice austenitics start uh, composing a sig more significant fraction of materials. Then the nickel base alloys come in, and by these uh, very advanced designs, these plants are about a third of the nickel base alloys, clearly very high temperature, very strong materials, strong alloys. And just as an example, one of, the, one of the properties that is most important is the creep rupture strength of these very high temperature materials. And this plot shows the 100,000 hour creep rupture stress as a function of temperature um, for rupture in 100,000 hours. Uh, this is the line in the minimum uh, desired strength for these applications. And you can see that as you get up into this high temperature regime over 700 degrees, the only alloys that make it are these nickel base alloys, uh, such as 617, Inconel 740, Haynes 282. So the drive has been to these very high temperature, very strong uh, alloys um, as, as we push for more and more efficiency. And this graph just gives you an idea of, of for a specific components used in these plants, uh, what kind of alloys are being used. You can see as you go up the temperature scale, you start leaving the fritics behind, getting into the nickel base alloys here. Here we go through the austenitics to the nickel base alloys. And so you can see the progression. So in these high temperature environments that, that fossil plants see, um, clearly temperature is a big issue, uh, but so it's stress. Um, and and the, the property that I just I mentioned creep rupture strength is a key feature in the alloy selection and alloy qualification for these applications. But the environment's also important as well. And that means corrosion. Uh, because we have a coolant, and that coolant, um, uh, or, uh, or whether it be uh, uh, water or another coolant, uh, is going to be corrosive, especially at these temperatures. And so we're going to have high temperature corrosion issues. And in fact, high temperature components under stress and in a corrosive environment, stress corrosion cracking starts to work its way in. So I mention this because we can't just focus on one property like creep strength uh, for a, a material selection, but we also have to take into account these other degradation modes. And if you look at this uh, chart that uh, gives degradation modes for materials and coal-fired systems, mm -hmm. there are a variety of different uh, components here. Here are the environments um, uh, and uh, the deposits. But look at just the last column, and you'll see that the modes include oxidation, sulfidation, erosion, hot corrosion, uh, a lot of degradation modes that uh, can, can um, uh, compromise the function of these materials that may or may not even depend upon the stress. <clears throat> um, this is an interesting um, comparison. I've got uh, two materials here, a, a Fritic Martin Siddick uh, steels on the left and austenitic on the right. And this is the oxide scale as a function of exposure duration for 550 degrees Cs. And you'll notice that after about 10,000 hours, the oxidation uh, is about, uh, produces about a 70 micron thick scale. And if you just cross over to the other graph at that same thickness, 70 microns or 0.07 millimeters, and hits that graph at about 14% uh, um, 
uh, chromium, which isn't too different than the roughly uh, 10 to 12 percent in these alloys here. So alloy composition and tailoring alloys for these specific uh, purposes becomes very important. So with that as a backdrop, um, let me move over to the issue with reactors. Reactors pose a very interesting additional complication, and that's radiation. So instead of the simple uh, diagram I had of um, uh, degradation modes or components of that system, uh, I have to make it a little bit more complicated because in addition to high temperature and, excuse me, addition to high temperature and uh, stress and corrosion, I now have radiation. Of course, I have all combinations of these and sitting at the center is all four, which does occur. And this leads to a variety of degradation modes. If you consider just radiation at high temperature, and I'm going to show you some examples, we have some very interesting microstructures we have to deal with that, that you don't have to deal with in systems that have, that have no radiation, and there's a lot of them. Uh, loops, dislocation loops, cavities, precipitates, radiation-induced segregation. I'll show you that in a minute. <clears throat> radiation uh, at high temperature plus stress means radiation creep. It's a new creep mechanism uh, distinct from thermal creep, uh, radiation uh, fatigue, and reduction of fracture toughness, which can be absolutely dramatic in these systems. If you look at corrosion, uh, stress at high temperature, of course we have stress corrosion cracking issues. Uh, corrosion um, and irradiation, even without the, the application of stress, gives us an irradiation accelerated corrosion. And I'll show you a real nice couple examples of this in a little bit. And then combining all these uh, stressors or components of the environment together, radiation, corrosion, stress, and high temperature, you get a totally new phenomenon called a radiation assistance, stress, corrosion, cracking, all the bad things at once. Um, so to give you an idea of what happens to these materials under radiation, because um, unless you ha are fully immersed in this, you don't think about it too much. But one neutron hitting a solid can create a lot of damage. And this is an example of the damage created by a single interaction between a neutron and a lattice atom in iron. This is 20, uh, 100K uh, calculation using molecular dynamics performed by Roger Stoller at Oak Ridge. That neutron produces a 20 keV um, atom, uh, pKa, primary knock-on atom. This is a very typical energy for what you see in a, in a reactor. Um, excuse me. And if you watch the simulation, what you're seeing is the production of vacancies in interstitials. Interstitials are in green, vacancies are in red. And so it's a function of time. That's about a picosecond into the uh, damage. Uh, and after this uh, cascade settles down, you're left with uh, several tens, maybe even hundreds of vacancies in interstitials. These, as, as a result, elevate the vacancy in interstitial concentrations to orders of magnitude greater than thermal quantities especially interstitials. Interstitials actually matter now, whereas <laughs> when do they ever matter in most engineering materials? That, right? um, so uh, these uh, uh, vacancies, interstitials, and their partitioning and agglomeration are what's responsible for these unique microstructures we get under radiation. One of these are the formation of voids. They're holes, cavities. Uh, I show different shaped voids here in different materials, stainless steel, aluminum, magnesium. It really doesn't matter. You hit just about any metal or alloy long enough and hard enough, um, it'll start to form cavities. These cavities lead to dimensional instability. Uh, it's isotropic uh, volume, volumetric growth. And clearly, in an engineering structure, you can only tolerate so much dimension change before you start exceeding tolerances and things don't work. <clears throat> this is another example. These are faulted dislocation loops, and in, in this case, in uh, uh, three, three cases are faulted dislocation loops, sorry, in um, austenitic or FCC alloys, aluminum, copper, and nickel. In this case is, is iron. Uh, these dislocation loops, planar defects, uh, uh, create absolute havoc with regard to uh, strengthening and embrowment. You can increase the strength of an alloy by a factor of five with very modest uh, damage, irradiation damage. Of course, you reduce the fracture toughness by a factor of 30 
at the same time. Um, Radiation-induced segregation is another phenomenon whereby we have uh, a uh, coupling of solute atoms with the vacancy and interstitial fluxes going to a sink, such as a grain boundary. That coupling is such that the participation in the vacancy and interstitial flux is not the same as their composition in the alloy. So you get a, a change in composition at the grain boundary. And that change can be fairly substantial, in this case showing a strong depletion of chromium, really a strong enhancement of nickel, of silicon, and of phosphorus. So you no longer have an austenitic stainless steel you started with at the grain boundary. That means different properties, different behavior. Radiation induces clustering or precipitates. These are, again, picked in images from atom probe tips from stainless steel. Uh, after having received about 5 dPa of irradiation, this is after some proton irradiation. And you can see the clustering in the nickel, silicon, and even the copper uh, uh, precipitates. We published this work in 2011, and um, nobody had ever identified copper precipitates in stainless. And we thought, do we have a strange batch of stainless? No, we don't. There's a little bit of copper in stainless, and it comes out so readily because it's, so it's quite insoluble. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you can definitely get these precipitates. This is a nice example here done by uh, Emmanuel Marquis group showing um, a dislocation loop in an atom probe tip blown up here to show the segregation at that loop and the clustering, in this case, of the nickel atoms in green here. And there's also some silicon clustering as well. These clusters eventually turn into a precipitate. So let me, let me focus on, on, on just how difficult this challenge can be <clears throat> for a minute. I'm showing here just two components of a reactor environment, temperature and damage, radiation damage. We define damage in terms of displacements per atom. So one displacement per atom means that on average, every atom has been displaced one time in whatever, right? Whatever component you want, one time. So if you have a DPA of 100, Every atom has been displaced, on average, 100 times. This is a, a measure of the extent of damage. It's a better measure than just the flux of, of neutrons. It does couple a little bit to what's happening in the material. It's not perfect, but it's better. And this shows temperature on this scale. And what I'm illustrating here is uh, the body of our knowledge of radiation effects is essentially captured in this green bar, because this is where 400 of the 450 reactors in the world today operate. They're basically water reactors, variety of generations. They operate in a very narrow temperature range and at fairly modest damage levels. If your eyes are really sharp, you can see a difference in color here because the graph used to stop here. But we've got um, a lifetime extension of our plants. So they've, they've almost all been extended from 40 to 60 years and now Utilities are submitting applications to extend the life to 80 years, which is really phenomenal. But so I had to extend this a little bit too to go from 40 to 60. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, if you look at all the advanced reactor concepts, they're all sitting up here. There's not even an overlap in temperature. They're all at higher temperature, and most of them go to higher damage levels. So we have this whole region here to explore and to understand when this is our body of knowledge. Uh, these, are, these acronyms refer to this is a very high temperature gas reactor. Here's a supercritical water reactor in purple. This is also a gas reactor. Uh, this is a, a lead fast reactor using lead or lead bismuth as a coolant. Sodium fast reactor in, in, in uh, uh, red using sodium as a coolant. Uh, this is a molten salt reactor uh, using molten salt as a coolant, one of the most corrosive species we can think of, we use as a co coolant. Uh, fusion sits right here, and uh, a company called TerraPower has developed a concept of a traveling wave reactor, which will use a single core in its entire lifetime. You start it up, you turn it off in 60 years. So their damage needs are considerably greater than this. I have an arrow because it actually goes to 600. So it's over here somewhere. <clears throat> but I, I bring this up because I want to, I want to use one of these phenomena, the uh, void swelling, um, uh, as an example uh, of the development of materials to attack a problem like this. 
And void swelling, as I mentioned, is dimensional changes uh, under radiation by the formation of these cavities. Sometimes they have gas in them, sometimes they don't. And this is a nice illustration that Frank Garner put together quite a number of years ago. This is a fuel rod right here, unirradiated, and here's an irradiated rod. This was irradiated in, the, in a fast flux test facility out at Idaho many years ago. That facility is gone now. But you'll notice that it not only is increased in length, but it's also increased in diameter. It's volumetric swelling. And if you look at the tick marks in here, that's about a 10% increase in length. All right. That's about as much as you're going to be able to tolerate in reactor. Um, in fact, that's, that's, that's actually a little less. You can tolerate about 3% linear dimensional change, which means about 10% volume change. <clears throat> now here's why that's important. This is some data on a typical material that's been used in test reactors and has been um, uh, considered a candidate material for fuel cladding and core structural components in a fast reactor. It's just 316 stainless steel. This is 20% cold work 316. This was irradiated in a, a test reactor in the US, EBR2. And you'll notice swelling as a function of fluence here, neutron fluence, or here DPA. Let's go back to our DPA scale. And it's a variety of different temperatures. So you can see there's a strong temperature dependence to swelling. There's sort of a peak at, at an intermediate temperature. But what I want to show you is that that's the limit that we can tolerate. Beyond that, the tolerant, we lose tolerance. We're out of tolerance in our materials. Control rod drives don't fit in, and we run into big problems. So the objective is, how do we get this material or how do we find a material or an alloy that doesn't swell more than that amount for the lifetime of the component? <clears throat> this shows a little bit of the progression of how, how, how folks have attacked this. In one case, we changed alloys by going from a 304 to a 316. The increase in nickel was actually fairly, uh, made a fa fairly substantial impact on reducing swelling. Cold working actually reduces swelling as well, but we're still way above where we need to be. So then we have to resort to other techniques. And the community has sort of adopted this idea of radiation uh, tolerant materials and adopting or developing radiation tolerant materials based upon the need to introduce sinks. Sinks are nothing other than um, locations that can absorb vacancies and interstitials cause them to recombine, recreate the perfect lattice, so that if they don't agglomerate, we don't get voids, we don't get loops, we don't get precipitation, and so forth and so on. You're trying to remove the defects that you put in with the radiation. And you do that with sinks. We try and litter the microstructure with sinks. So here are some of the techniques that have been used. Uh, fine particles, uh, so-called NFAs, or nano-featured uh, 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 particles, or it, it, the, the, uh, the analog is these ODS, the oxide dispersion strength and materials. Okay. Very fine nanoparticles, not only ideally two nanometer sized uh, oxide particles, ideally homogeneously dispersed, their surface area provides tremendous sink for point defects. They'll absorb the defects and reduce the swelling. Um, another technique is radiation induced precipitation, which I'll mention. Uh, nanograins, re increasing the grain boundary, those are great sinks, and uh, multilayers. This is uh, an example of a ex uh, set of experiments that were conducted on um, three alloys, this EP450. Um, this is HT9. This is a, a Friedrich Martin Citic. That's a, also a very important candidate alloy for fast reactor use. And MA957, which is an ODS alloy. And the whole purpose of this is to show that the oxide dispersion strength in alloy has suppressed the swelling to considerably higher uh, damage levels compared to the other alloys by virtue of this, this large uh, uh, area of, uh, created by the, uh, the oxide particles. Another technique is can we engineer the material such that the precipitates are created during the radiation. And this was done with an alloy called D9. This is an experimental alloy 
that had additions of titanium and a little bit more carbon. And then the irradiation ended up forming titanium carbides, which provided the sink, which reduced the swelling. And so you can see here, uh, oops, I'm sorry, a nominal 316 stainless steel and a D9, this titanium modified 316. Again, it sort of prolonged the, the period of nucleation such that it eventually did start to swell, but you got more life out of it. Uh, Ultrafine greens, a lot of work being done in ultrafine green material, um, equal channel annular processing. Uh, ECAP, here's an, a nice example um, out of A&M on some work that was done on a 304. Here's a coarse green 304 and an ultra fine green 304. Grain sizes are 35 microns here and 100 nanometers here. And in this particular case, irradiation at 500 degrees C resulted in swelling of the coarse green material according to this rate and swelling of the ultra fine green material here. The damage levels are not real high, but at least Early on, it looks very, very promising. The problem with ultrafine greens is that ultrafine green structure would really like to coarsen. So there are temperature limits, and if you exceed those limits and you end up coarsening the greens, um, you actually lose the benefit. And in fact, in this particular case, the swelling was worse in the ultrafine green T91 than in the coarse green T91. And uh, a topic that um, our chair um, at MISRA knows very well because he did a lot of work on this at Los Alamos, and I think you're still playing around with this multi-layer stuff, right? Um, multi-layers, the interfaces in multi-layers are tremendous sinks, wonderful sinks, and in very, fairly short distances, you can raise the sink density by a huge amount. So this is a nice example then uh, of, of, of his uh, colleagues, he and his colleagues, who looked at, in this particular case, helium ion irradiation of 50 nanometer copper uh, vanadium multilayers. They irradium to 5 dPa. That's a lot of helium. They put in a lot of helium. And, uh, and you can see the different layers right here, okay? The surface is up here. Peak damage is right about here. And you'll notice that as you go through the peak damage re region, this just shows the uh, layers themselves and that the uh, uh, layer structure is just perfectly preserved right through that peak damage region. So the layer structure was not interrupted uh, for this irradiation and um, uh, served as a very nice sink. In fact, I think you were able to accommodate huge amounts of helium before you actually started getting bubbles, which is, which is one of the objectives. Helium is very bad in terms of nucleating um, or stabilizing voids. This is a really nice success. The challenge there is how do you make components out of this, obviously, right? But I'm sure you guys are working on that, right? 